Hey team, Dr. Jake Ward here. My previous two videos I discussed how the lung works and now I discuss how the lung breaks, looking at inflammation in the lungs and what that can cause. In this video, I'm going to cover how do we know smoking is bad for you. I'm sort of going to do a little brief history about how we discovered that smoking causes lung cancer. Now, obviously we can see it's bad here. Here is a, a healthy lung being inflated. Here is a smoker's lung being inflated. And we can just see the difference right there. But how do we get here? How do we know this? Um, and it all starts with epidemiology, to be honest. But I just want to touch on sort of a forgotten superhero of science. Um, Dr. Rufo was an Argentinian, and he made all these amazing discoveries about smoking, but it's likely that it didn't interfere with the course of humanity because his publications didn't get widely known or widely distributed. And it kind of shows you that there's two things to do with science. There's science communication, networking, getting your results understood, um, and out there to the scientific community and to the public, and then there's performing great science. Now, Rofo did some fantastic science, so let's just jump into that. Um, he, uh, he showed that painting uh, tobacco tar on the back of rabbits uh, caused cancer at that site. He showed that if you removed nicotine from the tar, it didn't affect the carcinogen carcinogenic nature of the tar so he showed that the cancer causing agents was in the tar and not in the nicotine itself um, he identified several uh, pure chemicals in the tar that could cause cancer all by themselves so he sort of even broke down the tar compositions and showed that some of the chemicals could directly cause cancer and he also had patients which he suspected that he noted he did all this research because he noticed his lung cancer patients seemed to often be heavy smokers he also noted that his skin cancer patients often were outdoor workers and the skin cancer sites often occurred on the nose and other exposed regions so he proposed sunlight may be causing skin cancer so what an absolute baller he made all these discoveries but you know it's debatable how much impact he had on the course of our understandings now, Mueller uh, arguably did much more. He did a cohort study. It was quite a poor designed uh, cohort study, case control study, I should say. He had 86 men with lung cancer, and he asked them to go find a friend who is similar who doesn't have lung cancer, uh, similar age and other things, um, and got them to fill out a questionnaire. And this is essentially what he found, that uh, the people with lung cancer were much more likely to be extreme or very heavy smokers compared to the people without lung cancer. And so he published this, and this started to create a little ripple amongst the scientific community that here we're starting to see some real evidence. There were anecdotes all, all throughout the uh, 18th and 19th century. You know, there's even some old texts that talk about the damage of smoking. Um, the Timbuktu manuscripts, I believe, talk about the potential detriments to smoking so you know there's a there's a lot of things out there but this is when we first started to get that that little ripple turn into a little bit more of a wave with this uh, Mueller paper in the 1930s 1933 then in the 1950s, we started to get some bigger papers coming out, some bigger cohort studies. So here we can see the numbers, case control studies, uh, 600 and 800 people. Um, and so the, the numbers are much larger. And here we can see of uh, the people who are non-smokers, uh, the percentage that got lung cancer was 1.3. And of the people who were heavy smokers, the percentage that got lung cancer were 51%. Um, and there were smi slightly smaller numbers in the second study. But we can see massively that the control people are much more likely to be non-smokers and much less likely to be heavy smokers. So 14.6% of the controls um, were non-smokers and 19% were heavy smokers and they didn't have lung cancer. So... Um, most of the 1.9% of people with lung cancer were non-smokers. So, I mean, there's fairly convincing evidence right there. But it's not causative, it's case control, which means you're looking back. We kind of want to follow people forward. That's much stronger. That's a cohort study. Rather than looking back, looking forward, get a group of people, follow them. You smoke a lot. How, um, how do you get lung cancer in the future? By following people forward, you have much stronger uh, causative uh, 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 evidence than looking back like in a case control style.
case control trial. So this was a very, very large cohort trial. Um, and so what they did was they looked at death rates of people who not smoked to people who have smoked over a period of time, and they have rate per 100,000 people. So this is how many people would die of cancer at all sites given they were in this different group. So never smoked. If you look here at the age of 60 to 64, your your chances of dying in that age bracket are so much smaller if you haven't smoked. It is a phenomenal number. Now, this large American cohort trial really started to put waves on the map, right? This really gained momentum. Holy moly, it's looking like smoking is killing you. They also looked at cardiovascular disease and a number of other diseases, and they showed that all of these were up in the smoking group and much lower in the never smoked group. And they tried to control for all sorts of variables, which is very good. So it was a much more rigorous trial. And this is when culture started to change a little bit. But it was so slow. When you think about it, you know, my parents um, who, you know, were born in the 50s, they were still a smoking generation. And it was only really my generation, the millennial generation and younger, that really smoking got hit on the head through large government advertising campaigns, to be honest. Now, there were also some really good animal studies that sort of confirmed causality. So in this one, they took the smoke um, and they placed it on the back of mice and they looked at the rates at which they got uh, tumors over a long time. The ends on this trial were actually phenomenal. There was like 100 mice per group, which is really statistically powerful, but maybe not that ethical. Um, and so over 34 weeks, um, the controls aren't on this graph because none of them got any sort of tumors on the skin. So it was an acetone control, which is what they used to get this smoke tar. Um, whereas the uh, the tar groups, all males and females, here we can see the percentages increase. So you can see, you know, we're talking 70% of the mice got um, a skin cancer where the smoking tar was being painted on their back. So how does it do this? How does... Um, how does smoking increase your risk of cancer? Now, if you're wondering about what I'm just about to talk about, definitely go back and watch the previous video about inflammation in the lungs. So any particulate or damaging smoke chemical or anything that might cause tissue damage is going to cause inflammation in the lungs. Now, chronic inflammation, um, we get the production of all sorts of compounds that are damaging to our tissue, but we also get the production of what's called free radicals. These are very reactive molecules that react with something very close by, changing its chemical structure, right? Any chemical reaction is a change in chemical structure and chemical formula. So neutrophils, which are an immune cell, typically involved in inflammation. If you are smoking particulates and tar, your lungs are gonna be chronically inflamed because of those particulates in your lungs and the chemicals in your lungs. Now, inflammation causes reactive oxygen species. Now, reactive oxygen species react with molecules violently and very quickly close to you. Now, one of these reactive oxygen species, for example, is hydrogen peroxide. Another one is bleach, hypochlorite. It's exactly like bleach. Now, these reactive oxygen species will react with your DNA. Now, if you damage your DNA in any way, it will get repaired. There's an error rate in that repair process, so you massively increase the mutation rate. So chronic inflammation increases the mutation rate. And we actually see this all all the time so people with hepatitis was it which is inflammation of the liver are much more likely to get liver cancer so wherever there is chronic inflammation there is much more likely a uh, there is dna damage and therefore much more likely a mutation and therefore much more likely cancer so uh cigarette smoke also contains free radicals itself this one's nitric oxide and so these free radicals can go damage dna directly so that's also in cigarette smoke Cigarette also contains uh, radioactive metals like radon, um, and radon uh, radioactively decays into lead and polonium, I think, and during that they release alpha and beta radiation. Now you will have heard of gamma radiation probably, it caused the Hulk, right? Gamma radiation, everyone knows gamma radiation, everyone's scared of gamma radiation. Gamma radiation can get through things, right? It, it can go through lead, a thin layer of lead. Gamma radiation can get through that. That's why we're scared of it. It's very hard to stop gamma radiation. But that very phenomenon means that it's not actually 
uh, massively carcinogenic gamma radiation. Low doses of gamma radiation are, are not massively carcinogenic. That's because mostly it passes through you. It doesn't interact with you. Alpha and beta radiation we're not that scared of, and that's because a piece of tin foil or even just two pieces of clothing can stop gamma uh, alpha and beta radiation. It can immediately stop it. Um, alpha radiation is a proton, beta radiation is a firing electron. Those things are uh, heavy matter that can be stopped, right, by just a few layers of clothing. So we're not that scared of it. Even your skin, it'll just hit your skin, and then that dead skin cell will flake off. We're not that scared of it. If it's inside you, that's another story. Alpha and beta radiation are much more carcinogenic than gamma radiation because they react. That's why they can't get through your shirt. They react with your shirt. So they're much more likely to react with the DNA and cause mutations. So having radioactive compounds inside your body is incredibly dangerous for causing future ca cancers. And so cigarette smoke contains radon, the radioactive compound, which radioactively decays, releasing alpha and beta radiation, which damages DNA, which causes errors and mutations, which causes cancer. And lastly, or not lastly, there are carcinogenic compounds. Um, this is nitrosylamine. Well, this is actually an alkali alkylation agent, but it's nitrosylamine that forms this. So you breathe in nitrosylamine. Anyway, it's complicated. But anyway, this forms in your lungs following breathing in cigarette smoke. And so essentially cigarette smoke contains direct carcinogens. These molecules here can react directly with um, your uh, bases in your DNA, causing mutations, causing repair, so on and so forth. So these are direct carcinogens right there. So inflammation, ROS, e.g. bleach, ROS, e.g. nitric oxide here, radioactive, e.g. radon, and carcinogens like nitrosamines that, that get activated in your body. So nitrosamines aren't directly carcinogenic, but they get activated into a carcinogen in your body. But anyway, I'm getting way too into it. Carcinogens like nitrosamines. It's almost like a pro-drug, but it's a pro-carcinogen um, that can react with the DNA, causing cancer. So, um, what about this graph? What about this experiment here? Here we've got some mystery chemical here, and it is causing a massive release of hydrogen peroxide, which is a reactive oxygen species. So we might hypothesize that this chemical, if inhaled over a long period of time, would cause cancer. Here we have uh, uh, another response caused by this chemical, um, and it's causing a cytokine called IL-8. IL-8 activates neutrophils, causes them to degranulate and release all those reactive oxygen species, and so uh, it's going to cause chronic inflammation. So this chemical here is also inducing chronic inflammation. So whatever this chemical is, is inducing inflammation and reactive oxygen species, we would guess if you were chronically exposed to this chemical inside your body, we would guess that it would increase your risk of Alzheimer's disease. That would need confirmation, but from this data, it's looking probable that we might get some, uh, it might increase your risk of cancer. So what chemical is under the question marks? Oh yeah, sorry, just some labels there. Hydrogen peroxide, inflammatory cytokines, vape fluid. So um, you might think vaping is a way out. Now, I think the data strongly supports that vape fluid is better than smoking, but is vape fluid better than not vape fluid? I think the data is already showing vape fluid is not better than not vaping. So although vaping is better than smoking, vaping is not better than uh, just not breathing anything into your lungs. Uh, but we've already got early signs here that vape fluid may uh, be may contribute to your risk of lung cancer. However, the, where did they do this? Where did this data come from? So this is the title paper there, Inflammatory and Oxid Oxidative Responses Induced by Exposure to Commonly Used Cigarette Flavoring Chemicals. Um, where was this, uh, what, how was this research done? Where did those graphs come from? And the answer is cell culture. So they came from dishes that contained cell, just a pure layer of cell culture. And these are macrophages attempting to mimic those alveoli macrophages. So this is cell culture, which is a long way away from a human being. So it's very preliminary data. But let me explain what cell culture is. While we're here, let me do a video on cell culture. What is it? How does it work? So that's coming up next.